All right, it's nine o'clock, everyone. Um, good morning. Welcome to the second day of SUNY Law. Um, this morning, we will be hearing from Timothy Jackson, who is from the SUNY Shared Library Services. He's been the resource sharing and fulfillment program manager there since um, April 2019. Prior to this position, he worked at the University of Albany's Access Services Department for nearly 20 years. And I will um, give it over to Tim. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Timothy Jackson. I'm the Resource Sharing and Fulfillment Program Manager for SUNY Library Shared Services. Um, we've actually gone back and forth on our name since I wrote that. At the time, we were calling ourselves SUNY Shared Library Services, but we're now SUNY Library Shared Services, or SLSS. Right, and I'm here this morning to talk to you all about um, SUNY resource sharing in Alma, um, just to go over our experiences from this past year. Sorry. Uh, so just uh, a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, the resource sharing environment in SUNY prior to Alma implementation. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the process of implementing Alma resource sharing for all of SUNY. Um, then I'll go through some Alma resource sharing statistics to give you an idea of how things have been going so far. Then I'll talk about how we've been addressing some of the issues that we've run into since go live with Ex Libris. Um, then I'll talk about the impact COVID-19 has had on resource sharing within SUNY. Um, I'll talk then about how we've been trying to expand resource sharing options in Alma. And then lastly, I'll just go over some other future plans that we have. So prior to implementing Alma, the vast majority of SUNY campuses were using ILLiad to send and receive resource sharing requests via OCLC. Um, and that is still true at the vast majority of campuses. Um, Alma resource sharing has not replaced Iliad. It now supplements Iliad. Um, most SUNY libraries were using and are still using IDS logic to streamline their workflows in Iliad. So we, we were operating in a highly customized and streamlined environment for resource sharing within SUNY. Unfortunately, this system um, has a lot of costs associated with it. There's the, the license fee for the Iliad client. Um, the majority of SUNY libraries their Iliad servers are hosted by OCLC, which means there is an OCLC server hosting fee that they have to pay. There's also their WorldShare ILL subscription fees. Because um, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Iliad, all Iliad really does is it sits on top of WorldShare ILL and makes it easier for you to send and receive requests through that system but the actual act of passing requests back and forth between libraries, that's all happening in WorldShare ILL, um, which can be quite costly. Um, we have some libraries paying tens of thousands of dollars every year for their WorldShare ILL subscription. And lastly, um, since most SUNY libraries belong to the IDS project. Um, there's also the annual IDS project membership fee on top of that. So when you add those four things together, um, Iliad and OCLC resource sharing can be pretty uh, costly. And for some of our campuses where there isn't a very high volume of requests, when you start thinking about those expenses, um, in a, from a cost per transaction perspective, um, the, the numbers start to get a bit ugly. Um, so, I mean, yes, we, we did have and do still have um, a highly customized and streamlined environment where we can send and receive requests. But as far as being um, financially efficient uh, for a lot of campuses, it isn't. And I, I will be talking about that more later in this presentation. And one last thing I want to point out about Iliad and OCLC. Um, 
that system is managed independently at each SUNY campus. So there really was, and within that system still is not much in the way of centralized management. It's, it's all campuses just operating independently of each other. Um, so setting their own loan periods, um, creating their own workflows. Um, it, it really, you know, what's happening in Iliad and OCLC really runs the gamut throughout SUNY. Um, so in August, or excuse me, in the summer of 2019, SUNY implemented ALMA, which has a resource sharing component. And we implemented that for all of SUNY for books and media requests throughout the summer of 2019. Um, we did not implement article resource sharing in ALMA at Go Live, um, but we have done that since, and I will be talking about that a bit more later in this presentation. Um, the process of implementing resource sharing in ALMA involved a lot of large group training webinars um, and creating FAQs. Um, I did some of that. I should also point out that um, Shannon Pridding, Heidi Webb, and Logan Rath also did a lot of work in that area. So um, I do want to thank them for um, paving the way for me. And it really was really helpful, their work, um, when I first came on, that they had already done a lot of work in this area. Um, in addition to these large group webinars, um, I did a lot of small group training sessions on Iliad integration with Alma and how to create lending deflections in Alma. And I also did a lot of one-on-one -on -one training sessions on the lending workflows. And in fact, every time I brought a new lender live in the system beforehand, I would have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with that library to make sure that they understood the workflows and that everything was functioning properly. And by the end of the summer of 2019 or the start of the fall semester, nearly every SUNY campus was lending in Alma. And um, implementing Alma resource sharing, it's had some really nice benefits. Um, the biggest one so far has been that it's cloud-based and not client-based. We didn't really understand how useful that would become at the time, but we, we certainly do now. Um, I know a lot of libraries are struggling to maintain their connection to Iliad in this um, work from home environment. Um, fortunately, that, that is not an issue with Alma. Um, another nice thing about Alma resource sharing is that the, the borrowing and lending workflows are, are highly automated. Um, also, Alma resource sharing allows for more central management within SUNY. So we did create a shared loan period and renewal policy for all of SUNY. So when a user requests an item and receives it from another SUNY library, um, they know that they will be getting a 16 week loan um, with up to three renewals if you're faculty or grad student. Um, there are no renewals for undergrads. I should also point out that um, for what we consider protected collections, um, rare items, media, um, there is a shorter 30 day loan period with one 30 day renewal for all users. Um, so in addition to implementing a shared loan period and renewal policy, we were also managed, able to coordinate um, what is referred to as ROTA management. What a ROTA is, is it essentially determines how requests flow through the system. So if a user submits a request at Buffalo, the ROTA determines which libraries it will go to first. So we can set things up to say requests from Buffalo should initially go to libraries in the western part of the state then move on to libraries in the eastern part of the state and then move to downstate libraries. And by doing this for all of SUNY, um, we're really able to coordinate where lending requests are going. Um, Alma doesn't have any load leveling capabilities for resource sharing, um, but centrally managing the rotas and how requests flow through the system um, is a next best option there. Um, and like I was saying with Iliad, there, there was no central management. So you had you know, all 60 libraries independently determining where their requests go. So it was, it was easy to create scenarios where 
you had a lot of libraries sending their requests to just a handful of lenders. Um, that's, that's not an issue in Alma. We can centrally manage that. Um, also, Alma gives us the option for running system-wide analytics reports to get a good picture of what's happening with resource sharing throughout the SUNY system. Um, we could do a little bit of that sort of thing through the IDS project um, in Iliad, but as far as getting system-wide statistics, um, being able to run analytics reports from the Alma network zone has been really, really useful. Um, I should also point out that implementing resource sharing in Alma did not create any additional costs to campuses. We were just simply deciding to use a system we're all already paying for. And lastly, I, I do want to point out that, like I, I alluded to this earlier, it is possible to integrate Alma and Iliad. On the borrowing side, <coughs> excuse me, you can take unfilled requests in Alma and automatically kick them out to Iliad so they can be filled through OCLC. When you're receiving items in Iliad, you can um, automatically create temporary item records in Alma for those items, which would allow you to First of all, circulate the item in Alma so you're not having to circulate in two different systems. Also, by doing that, it allows your users to log into Primo and see all of their requests, um, all of the items they have checked out, both from your collection and through Iliad. And on the lending side, um, the integration really streamlines that workflow. Uh, back when we were all still using Olive, when you would loan an item in Iliad, you'd have to updated to shipped in Iliad, and then manually check the item out in Olive. That's no longer necessary if you're using the integration. Once you ship an item in Iliad, it's automatically checked out in Alma. So that's the good of implementing Alma resource sharing. I'm not going to pretend that there haven't been any bads, any downsides. Um, there was a new workflow that everyone had to learn in addition to the Iliad workflows. And again, Alma has not replaced Iliad at any campuses yet, although I will be talking a bit about that later in the presentation. Um, for the vast majority of campuses, they are now using Alma and Iliad side by side. So having that second workflow has been a bit of a challenge for some places. Um, also, not, not all libraries have embraced borrowing in Alma. Um, in part because they don't want to have to manage multiple systems. Um, I'll also admit not all camp, camp well, <coughs> excuse me, not all campuses are happy with the shared loan and renewal period policy. Some think that the 16 week loan is too long. Um, there have been some other issues with Alma resource sharing. Uh, when we first went live, it was very difficult to print because all printing was email based. Fortunately, since then, Ex Libris has implemented a feature called the Printouts queue, which has made printing much easier. Um, letters are difficult to edit in Alma. In fact, it, that is still the case. They, are, they have made some positive change, but um, it's still not very easy to edit a letter that gets sent to a user. Um, and lastly, I want to point out that the requesting process in Alma is, it's a little too tied to the results of Primo searches, in my opinion. Um, so what has to happen is a user needs to search for an item in Primo, find the record, and then click the request link in that record to generate a request. We don't have any blank resource sharing um, request forms at this time, although that is something we're working on and I'll talk about that a little more in a bit. <clears throat> so now that I've talked a bit about um, the, the good side and the bad side of implementing resource sharing in Alma, I want to go through some statistics just to give you a sense of how things have been going so far. Um, to date, we have had more than 20,000 requests submitted since we went live, um, which is good. So the, the system is getting used. Um, although the request distribution we're seeing in Alma is very different than what we were used to seeing in Iliad. The most heavy, the heaviest borrowers would always be the university centers, and that's still true. But borrowing among the university centers was always roughly 
equal. Um, Buffalo being our largest institution was always out in the lead by a bit. Um, but since we've gone live with all the resource sharing, um, the gap between Buffalo and everyone else has grown substantially. Buffalo is responsible for nearly half of all the borrowing requests in Alma. And the reason for that is how Buffalo configured Primo. When you do the default everything search in Primo at Buffalo, those results will include items owned by other SUNY campuses. So they have included the SUNY search code scope in their everything search. Um, most libraries have not done that, um, mainly out of concern that holdings from other libraries will drown out their own holdings. Um, so really the, the, the main reason we're seeing so many requests at Buffalo is Primo is exposing their users to more records of items held by other SUNYs, which means they're seeing more requests. Conversely, we've seen some very low request volume at camp at certain campuses. Again, it's, it's likely due to how Primo was configured, um, really making the SUNY search scope less visible to their users. Um, so the, the change in the request distribution did require us to rethink how lending requests are distributed throughout SUNY on the fly. Um, we had to take some steps to distribute Buffalo's borrowing requests more widely throughout the state instead of keeping them all in the western part of the state as much as possible. Also on the lending side, um, because so many borrowing requests were coming out of Buffalo, naturally Buffalo isn't going to be a lender for one of their own borrowing requests, so their lending volume was relatively low. Um, so for some campuses, we started um, manipulating their rota management to push more requests to Buffalo. And just to illustrate what I'm talking about, these are the borrowing and lending volumes for the month of February, which is the last month I have full statistics for. Um, and you can see here that the University at Buffalo um, far outpaced our next highest borrower, which is the University at Albany. Buffalo had more than four times the number of borrowing requests. And you can see also um, that libraries like Potsdam, Cortland, and Oneana were able to sneak into the top 10 with only you know, 33 or 30 requests. Um, so it goes to show um, how low the request volume is at some of our campuses. Um, on the lending side, you can see that there's a bit more even distribution. Um, the University at Albany has been our biggest lender, um, but we did manage to get Buffalo's borrowing volume high enough, or excuse me, their lending volume high enough that they're in, at least in line with Binghamton and just a little bit behind Albany. And I see that there's something in the Q and A. Um, Angela Rhodes asked, do you have any information on UB's patron satisfaction with using the, the resource sharing option? Do patrons understand that they are requesting a resource from another campus rather than from their own institution? Um, I'm afraid I don't have any information on UB, uh, their patron satisfaction, but um, Buffalo has configured the request link in Primo, I, I forget exactly what it says, but, but it is pretty clear that you are requesting an item from another campus. So they, they, they are aware of that. Um, so now that I've talked about um, request volumes a bit, I also wanna talk about turnaround times and fill rates. And I'm very happy to say that largely turnaround times have been very good in Alma. Um, in fact, I've taken some data from Albany and Buffalo Alma and their Iliads and compared them. And it's pretty clear that um, Alma resource sharing is significantly faster than Iliad. Um, at Albany, the average Iliad turnaround time 
um, was 6.8 days at the, for the period I looked at. In Alma, it was only 3.8. Um, at Buffalo in Iliad, it was 6.3 days. In Alma, it was only 3.9. So these are significant differences. And uh, I think the, the main reason is Alma's automated locate process. Um, so what happens when a user submits a request is Alma takes the metadata it receives from Primo and then runs an automated Z3950 check at every SUNY campus um, to make sure that, well, to see, first of all, if they own the item. And if they do own the item, Alma also checks the item's availability and requestability. So Alma is only sending libraries requests that they should be able to fill. Um, so the lending fill rate in Alma is significantly higher than it is in Iliad because in Iliad requests are going through OCLC and there's no way for the lender or excuse me the borrower to get any sort of um, availability data that way unless they go in and manually check the potential lenders catalog which I can't imagine very many libraries are doing. Um, so yeah, this, this has been, I've been very pleased um, that on average, you know, requests for books and media are being filled in about four days. And that's just four calendar days. I'm not discounting weekends or anything like that. Um, another interesting fact I learned um, in looking at this data is the geographic location of libraries doesn't really matter as much as you would think it would. Um, for any library upstate to request from another library upstate, the turnaround time is usually about the same. So it doesn't take any longer to get an item from Binghamton to Buffalo than it does from Albany to Buffalo or even Plattsburgh to Buffalo. Um, where I do see discrepancies is between upstate and downstate. Um, and by downstate, I'm, I'm referring really just to the New York City area. Um, there is a significant lag in getting an item from the city to an upstate library. Um, but generally speaking, moving items around upstate, it doesn't really matter where you are. So this, we could end up rethinking how we're distributing requests based on this. So I think we would still want to try to keep downstate requests downstate as much as possible and upstate requests upstate. But as far as like trying to keep them in certain parts of upstate, over others, I'm not sure how much we're really accomplishing there. Um, so the news on the turnaround time front has been good. Um, unfortunately, the fill rate that we're seeing in Alma has not been what we were hoping for. Um, it's hovered pretty consistently in the high 50s since um, September 19, when, 2019, when we finally had nearly all of the libraries in SUNY lending. We have managed to make some slight improvements, um, but we're, we're still, or as of, you know, February and early March, we were still seeing fill rates down around 60%. Oops, sorry, having some issues here. Come on. There we go. Um, so this is a table of our fill rate and turnaround time by month. Um, you can see for the month of August, it was only around 50%. Um, by the time September rolled around, we got it up to 54 um, because we were able to introduce some more lenders. And it's gradually cre crept up closer to 60, um, but we haven't managed to get much past 60. But on the turnaround time front, um, things are improving. Back in August, it was on average 4.7 days. And it has slowly decreased since then. Um, we did see an uptick in January. Um, I think it's relatively safe to say that that was due to the Christmas break slowing things down. But generally speaking, turnaround times are getting better. Um, so one of the big things I've really been working on with Ex Libris is um, our fill rate and trying to find ways to, to improve that. And what we've really been focusing on is how that locate process I mentioned previously works. And again, that's the process where once a request is submitted, Alma is running automated Z3950 checks 
of all SUNY campuses to determine who can potentially lend the item. Um, and we have found a few problems with the locate process that was suppressing our fill rate. Um, first of all, we discovered that there were some issues with how Primo was passing author information to Alma. It was sometimes appending just some, some really garbage information onto the end. And then when the locate process would try to search on that data, because there was that weird information at the end, it was causing the locate process to miss holdings at some institutions. Um, fortunately, Ex Libris has fixed this, um, and that's been partially responsible for the slight uptick we saw throughout the fall. Um, another issue that we ran into um, was with OCLC numbers, because there are a lot of instances where SUNY holdings for a specific item are spread out over multiple OCLC records, which means there are now multiple records in our new network zone for the same item. And these records all have different OCLC numbers. And by locating on the OCLC number, that means that you're only going to find holdings attached to the record that the patron used to submit the request. So if there are 10 to 15 additional holdings on a different record, the locate process is going to miss all of those. Um, so what we did in, um, I did this in early March. I removed the OCLC number from everyone's locate settings. And that did produce a increase in the fill rate. We actually got it up a little higher than 60%. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have a lot of data on the impact removing the OCLC number had on things because, um, well, we had to shut down the system just a few weeks after I made that change. Um, I forget the exact date we turned everything off. It was approximately March 20th um, because so many libraries had closed and were not capable of lending and then the Empire Library Delivery Courier shut down. So there was, there was no point in keeping Alma Resource Sharing active. It, they just would have like guaranteed unfilled requests. So what we did as um, a temporary measure because um, we suspect that there will be a lot of users taking online classes in the summer and fall and they won't necessarily be located near their libraries. Um, once we shut down resource sharing, um, we, we started thinking about what things would have to look like once we were able to bring the system back up. And knowing that a lot of users wouldn't be close to their home campus, we implemented um, through the um, Access Services and Resource Sharing Working Group um, a temporary policy to allow walk-in borrowers to submit resource sharing requests. So if you have a user, say, at UAlbany who's living closer to New Paltz and would like to be able to pick up an item at New Paltz, what they can do is get a walk-in borrower account from New Paltz and then use that to submit requests to have items delivered to New Paltz. Um, we also implemented a temporary policy that allow users to return items that they have borrowed to any SUNY campus. And we're also, um, we've developed a workflow for how to deal with these returns that, these items that are being returned to other campuses. Um, basically the workflow involves the library submitting the barcode of the item to SLSS, then SLSS updates the user record to check the item in and then moves the item to a temporary location indicating that it has been returned at another campus. Um, we're still developing plans for turning physical resource sharing back on. I'm afraid I don't have too much information on that right now. Um, there, things are still too much in flux to really develop any solid plans. Uh, but one thing I do want to say is please be sure to keep um, SLSS and um, the ELD courier informed of your reopening plans because you know getting good information from you will be extremely vital to us figuring out how we're going to turn 
everything back on. Um, something else that has happened since COVID-19 is um, because of the budget concerns that the pandemic has created, a lot of campuses are starting to rethink um, how much money they're spending on resource sharing, um, as well as a host of other things. Um, so in response to that, we really fast tracked the implementation of our article resource sharing in Alma so that libraries who need to rethink whether they can afford Iliad and OCLC have an alternative for article requesting. So to date, we have implemented article resource sharing at nine campuses. Um, we have four others who are currently testing. We also have um, nine libraries who have agreed to lend articles in Alma. It's the four university centers and um, a handful of the four-year colleges. Um, and generally speaking, um, the workflows are pretty simple and straightforward, particularly on the lending side. Um, but on the borrowing side, the delivery of articles to users requires um, the library to manually forward an email to the user. So it's, it's not a fantastic workflow. Um, and at this point in time, Alma article resource sharing is really only suitable for low volume libraries. Um, fortunately, Alma is capable of sending a download link directly from the lender to the borrower's user, which would eliminate the need to manually forward emails from the borrowing library to their user. Unfortunately, um, the link in that email is currently broken. We are working with Ex Libris on this, and we've been told that um, a fix to this issue should be part of the August release. So hopefully by the time the fall semester starts, we can really tighten up that workflow um, and make Alma article resource sharing an option for some of our higher volume libraries, if that's something they wish to pursue. Um, also, because we, we suspect that some SUNY campuses will have to um, stop doing resource sharing in Iliad and OCLC because of budgetary concerns, um, we've really stepped up our efforts to expand access to materials through resource sharing in Alma. Um, I've been working a lot with Union College on physical resource sharing. In fact, I have a meeting with them right after this presentation. Um, I've also been talking to Ithaca College, Nazareth College, St. John Fisher, and a handful of others about possibly doing resource sharing with SUNY in Alma. Um, on the article side, um, we've been discussing the possibility of doing article resource sharing with the MinPals Consortium in Minnesota and the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities system. Um, and we'll also continue to reach out to other consortia. Um, and we could even extend these um, out of state partnerships to include physical resource sharing at some point in the future. And naturally, we've also started having discussions about Alma resource sharing with CUNY. Um, they are in the middle of implementation right now. Their Alma Go Live um, is sometime in August. Um, so they're not in a position where they can really work on this with us right now, but um, once they're able to get through implementation and things start to settle down, we undoubtedly will be working quite heavily with them to link up resource sharing for our two systems. Um, because it, it just makes so much sense since we're all on the same career. Um, so hopefully we can have that all situated in the not too distant future. But really the end goal here is to increase um, our Alma fill rates. Um, we're hoping that by you know, partnering with places like Union College or the CUNY system, we can get that fill rate up from a, where it is right now, which is about 60%, um, up closer to 70, 75%. And I see there's some activity in chat. Oh, it looks like those questions have been answered. Thank you, everybody. There is one question Q and A. If you wanted to, oh sure, it really quickly. Um, 
very nice and thorough. I'm sorry, what is that automated check process called? Um, that's, um, it's the locate process. Um, there are actually things, um, there are settings in everyone's Alma called locate profiles. Um, so, and you, each campus should have a locate pro profile for every other campus in the SUNY system. And every time a request is submitted, um, a job is run to activate all of those locate profiles to check to see who has requested items or who owns the item that is being requested. Let's see how we're doing for time. Let's see, I've got about five minutes left. Um, so that's um, where things currently stand as far as our efforts to expand access through Alma resource sharing. Um, other future plans we have, um, like I was saying, uh, we'll continue to look at turnaround time and uh, request volume data to refine our management of rotas, which again, those are what determines how requests move through the SUNY system. Um, so we've, We've made some changes since go live and we'll continue to tweak that to um, move requests through the system in the most you know, equitable and efficient manner. Um, we'll also continue working with Ex Libris on addressing some of the issues that we're having. Um, one thing that has been a problem is the request form loading and submission speed in Primo. Um, Primo, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is it's not the fastest. Um, there are particularly bad issues with the request form. Um, fortunately, um, Ex Libris is committed to working on that and they have made some changes that have definitely helped. We still see um, a pretty bad lag the first time a user logs into the system and tries to submit a request. Um, it can take five or 10 seconds for the form to load, which is far from ideal. Fortunately, subsequent requests go much, much, much faster, but that first request is still pretty slow. So um, we are working with Ex Libris on that. Um, also, we're working on um, trying to make improvements to how the locate process functions and how rotas are created. Uh, one stumbling block that we keep running into is um, when a request is submitted and the locate process runs, um, it's fully automated. There's really no option or opportunity for manual intervention. Um, and that locate process is what creates the list of libraries where the request will go. Um, and unfortunately, once that list is created, editing it involves a lot of manual work. Um, and this is really the source of why we have not been able to implement a blank resource sharing form. Because, you know, the locate process, it really needs good metadata to work well. And when you have users just filling out blank forms, as I'm sure many of you know, you're not always getting good data. Um, so if a user were to fill out a form and provide some bad information or provide some incomplete information, if the locate process uses that information to put together a rota, because it's incomplete or inaccurate, that rota is going to, you're going to have a lot of wrong libraries in it, um, a lot of libraries that should be in it, won't be in it. Um, so sending out a request using that rota will create a lot of problems. Um, and there's really no good way to manually edit that rota before the request is created. It, it's very labor intensive. So we're trying to work with them on improving that process. So we can, for instance, create a scenario where a user can fill out a blank form and we can stop the process if certain metadata is missing give libraries an opportunity to correct that metadata and then recreate the rota um, from scratch instead of having to manually delete the old one and create a new one. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the big things we're working with Ex Libris on. Um, we're also gonna continue pushing on um, getting them to make letter editing easier. Um, we're also planning um, and have already had co conversations with them about being able to boost local holdings in Primo. Because recall, 
earlier when I said that a lot of libraries haven't included the SUNY scope in their everything search, that's because um, they're afraid that their holdings will be drowned out by holdings from other libraries in the SUNY system. It's, it's a particular concern um, at some of the smaller four-year colleges or the community colleges. Um, they're worried that if they include the SUNY scope in their everything search, the users are going to see a bunch of books from like Buffalo and Binghamton and Albany before they see their own books. So we're working with Ex Libris on allowing libraries to boost their own holdings within Primo search results, which is currently not something that can happen. But if we can get to a point where that is possible, then hopefully more campuses will add the everything or the SUNY scope to their everything search, which could help address some of the disparity in request volume we're seeing between Buffalo and the rest of the SUNY system. Um, also, um, we're working on improving Alma and Iliad integration because that's, you know, even though we, we do expect a lot of libraries or at least some libraries to drop Iliad in the next year or so, um, we understand that for a lot of our campuses, dropping Iliad and OCLC is not an option, um, that they'll still need to use it. So we want to make sure that the integration between Iliad and Alma is as tight as it can possibly be. <clears throat> Another thing we're working on is expanding SUNY participation in Rapid ILL, which um, was recently acquired by Ex Libris. Um, so that gives us um, an opportunity to negotiate with Ex Libris on, you know, the possible, you know, SUNY-wide discounts for Rapid ILL memberships. I'm, I'm not making any promises there, but that, that's something we'll definitely, you know, discuss with them. Um, also, Ex Libris has a next generation resource sharing system called um, Rapido or Rapido. I'm not sure which it is, and it's a kind of silly name, but that's what they're going with. Um, and we're working with Ex Libris on arranging for a few SUNY campuses to be um, early adopters of uh, Rapido. Um, I think it'll be helpful to have those a few early adopters within SUNY just to give us an opportunity to help, you know, shape the future of the product because we do see it as a potential replacement for Iliad down the line. Um, and again, a lot of the reasons that we're looking for alternatives to Iliad is simply that Iliad resource sharing is so expensive. And also, um, OCLC hasn't been very willing to revisit the pricing structure, particularly for World Share ILL. Um, and lastly, one of our major initiatives for this summer and fall will be to investigate the possibility of implementing a fulfillment network within SUNY. That's not something we did at Go Live. Um, what instead we implemented is peer-to-peer -peer resource sharing within our network zone. Um, but, but by implementing a fulfillment network, that could allow us to um, implement universal borrowing throughout SUNY. So any user from any campus could go anywhere in SUNY, borrow a book, and then drop that book off at any campus in SUNY which um, given the current situation we find ourselves in with COVID-19 um, and the fact that a lot of users are going to be taking classes online and they may not necessarily be close to their home institution, that will allow them to obtain better service from whichever SUNY institution is closest to them. And I see there's some more activity in the chat. Um, Ann asked, could you speak a bit on how you see Rapid ILL playing into the year ahead? Um, I could see Rapid ILL, you know, mainly playing a role in decreasing our dependence on OCLC for resource sharing. Um, because it, it does not pass Rapid, um, they have their own database of holdings. It doesn't rely on OCLC at all. Um, and by decreasing activity in OCLC, it could help us um, as far as like um, getting OCLC to, you know, bring down some of their prices. 
Um, Rapid ILL also has a lot of automation that's possible. It or creates a lot of opportunities for automation and Iliad <coughs> that um, aren't even possible through IDS logic. So by getting more libraries into Rapid, I think we could really tighten up Iliad workflows, which I know um, this current you know, financial crisis will almost certainly create some staffing issues. And by having more options for automation, um, I think that'll help campuses who have to make some tough decisions about um, you know, the lines they can't fill and you know, what things look like as they're dealing or trying to manage their work with fewer people. Um, Tim, probably just a couple more minutes. Um, yeah, I'm actually, that's everything I was hoping to get through today. So I think we can just open it up to more questions. So feel free to unmute yourself or type into the chat if you have any questions for me. I think we might be good. Um, if you, uh, uh, thank you very much, Tim. That was very interesting. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we will start getting ready for our keynote. Actually, it looks like we got a couple more questions. Um, Kristen asked, Yep, you're right. Can we keep track of items we ship back that are not ours? Um, I wouldn't worry about at this point. Um, keeping track of the items you ship back. What I would do is when you receive items, um, I have posted a form to Basecamp where you can send SLSS the barcodes of items that you have received from other campuses. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll do what I can on my end to update records at the home campus. Um, but that record of the fact that you received the item back should be very helpful if something were to happen um, in transit. Um, and Polly asked, how is load balancing performed more specifically? Um, right now, there, there is no real load balancing. Um, by managing rotas, that's the, that's the closest we can get to load balancing, um, but there is no true load balancing in um, Alma, and there's absolutely no load balancing in Iliad. So there is one question. Sure. Um, are campuses other than Buffalo expanding to SUNY search scope in everything search? Um, I believe a couple of campuses have, but largely no, not at this point. I think the major sticking point again is the issue of not being able to boost your own local holdings within the search results. Um, again, so there, there are concerns, um, particularly from, you know, some of the smaller campuses that their own holdings will be drowned out within, by holdings from other campuses and their users won't see records for books that are locally available to them. Um, so that's the reason we're, we're really pushing on um, Ex Libris to allow us to boost local holdings within search results. So we could create a scenario where, um, like, uh, Broom Community College could add the SUNY scope to their everything search and then say within the search results make sure you list Broom results before you list results from any other institution. All right, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, you everyone for attending. Good to go. All right, well, thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a good day and enjoy the rest of the conference.